They're immature males. Now, we're starting to So there are still some patients between the world. And I think it might be a bit of a big patient. I'm not aware of it's a good thing. I'm really afraid that we're going to be wiped out from the disease before we really understand. As a project, uh, Shark Quest Arabia was born out of the realization that despite uh, the global interest in shark conservation, there were a few, if any, local initiatives that I was aware of. I'm trying to make a couple of films in order to find a convincing argument. I want to try and find a way that we can communicate to a wide ranging audience of people as to why we should care about sharks. I've been working with information that goes back over the last 20 years. One of the figures that stands out the most in all of that time has been the continued use of a statistic that says that 100 million sharks are being killed every year. There are some uh, researchers around the world now who believe it's down to 70 or 80 million a year. Still a very significant number. One has to ask why. Because we're talking about 270,000 sharks every day around the world. And proportionally speaking, uh, it seems that no one really cares. When you break that down even more, you're talking about 11,500 sharks an hour are meeting a very brutal end, uh, the end of some line somewhere on this planet. And all basically uh, for the sole purpose of ending up in the Super Bowl. That's an alarming statistic, but proportionally speaking, no one cares. No one seems to really care about this animal. For every individual that does care, and there are a growing number around the world, of people that sign petitions, or express their concern, or get involved in conservation, there are over 20 million others who don't even know that we even have a problem, or don't even care. And that's the point of really this project for me because many people continue to ask me why they should care. It pains me to say that a lot of that killing is going on unregulated and uncontrolled, even here in this region. And this is as much an Arab world story as it is a global issue. What we have um, there is a very active shark fishing ground. The Omani fishermen are landing hundreds of thousands of sharks a year from these actual waters. It's a very rich area where we see a lot of nutrients coming in through the upwelling that channels this current through the Strait of Hormuz. And in so doing, carry with it a lot of uh, nutrients which attract the fish that feed on those plankton, whether it's zooplankton or uh, phytoplankton. And in turn, through the food chain, we start to see a buildup of the pelagic fish coming in and eventually the top apex predators, the sharks. Part of the motive for that question as to why they should care about sharks is really probably driven by the fact that they don't really know much about them. And for most people, a shark may be considered a man-eating monster from the you know, deepest recesses of our psyche. 
from our dark side. For me, sharks are the apex example of nature's finest evolutionary design. It's a perfect life form adapted to manage the food chain from the top. As an animal, it's equipped to defend itself against natural selection. It certainly has been an animal that's been vilified by the media, by movies, documentaries, and television. Obviously, uh, newspapers around the world are always quick to pounce on a story of a shark attack. And it's continuing to be presented despite what we've learned about sharks over the last 20 years as a cold-blooded killing machine. But we're filling in some of the details, and the media is also. So it's not just a cold-blooded killing machine. It's now a cold-blooded killing machine that's honed over 400 million years of evolution to be at the top of its food chain. So there is some added knowledge being imparted to the public, but it's still being represented or presented in this um, frightening manner. And yet, you know, we now know better. And certainly in the last 20 years, we've made a lot of progress as to what we do know. And we're living in this whole new world order where accessing information is really at the touch of a button. The internet itself provides instantaneous access to information. So why are we still making decisions that negate the decades of learning and dispense with the pure common sense? You know, we talked about the fear, but where's our love and compassion and even intelligence? Because when it comes to sharks, we just seem to dismiss everything that we know and make no mistake. Um, this is really one of the biggest and most shameful commercial sellouts that humanity has ever faced in terms of marine resources. Humanity has a tendency to destroy what it fears or fails to understand. That justifies to most people their continued closing of a blind eye to the fate of sharks around the world. So the only way we can save sharks I believe from disappearing from our seas is to really better understand the nature of this incredible animal. Historically speaking, Arabia's waters have been used as important nurseries and even pupping sites for thousands of years by a number of important shark populations from throughout the Indian Ocean. The same applies for cetaceans, turtles and even endangered dugong amongst others. So these waters were at one time considered remote and naturally safe, providing sanctuary for thousands of years by many species uh, due to really the absence or low impact of human presence. All the way up until the advent of the oil era when, when that changed. With, of course, the rapid growth and the development that spread throughout the region since the affluence provided by oil, human encroachment, coastal colonization, population growth, and of course, in line with that, the increased demand for fisheries have changed the shape and dynamics of all of the seas of Arabia in really less than 50 years. People are just generally not aware of the need to tackle some of these issues that we're dealing with. And in particular, when we talk to fishermen, um, they are continuing a practice that they've been involved with for hundreds of years, one form or another, where the skills and the instinctive knowledge they have about their natural world is passed on from generation to generation. Now, because that instinctive knowledge has in the past been successful for them. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right. It certainly doesn't necessarily mean it relates to the current world order, to what we need to apply now. Um, 
the world is obviously a, a rapidly changing place with a lot of radical changes to the environment. And in a very short time span, over a, between 50 to 100 years, man has literally altered the balance of nature. And in parts of the world, such as the Muslim Dam, you still you get a chance to really see that and how it's actually working. Because a lot of the practices and the methods used have remained relatively unchanged uh, for decades, if not centuries. You know, the interaction with fishermen is critical to the general survival of sharks because uh, they represent a source of knowledge which now the academic world needs to um, derive important data from and information. So what we need to do is establish a communication because we're talking about giving fishermen a reason to, to, as to why they need to be careful why they need to look at what this general big overview, this global story of sharks is um, represented. And in return, we need to take from them information that can help us progress the next priority, which and I actually in some ways is the main priority, and that is research. It is the gathering of information, gathering of data, understanding behavior, identifying hotspots, looking at um, areas of importance as nurseries, as pupping grounds of various species. And that will help, in turn, the conservationists to make important decisions about how to manage the resources. Unless we take a stand that really truthfully delineates the nature of the threats facing our natural environment and the wildlife that we're responsible to protect, then the world will continue to just be a collection of marketable resources that are being sold off to the highest bidder by those who are always just always ready, always poised to take advantage of loopholes. And that loophole really is mankind's lack of commitment to the natural order. It's clear to see that the, the reef systems, the ecology, ecology in general, is in good condition. In fact, we're surprised at just how well the coral reefs are doing. The sheer number of fish in general is healthy, but the sharks are missing from the coastal areas. So these sharks are probably more at offshore and deep sites. First of all, we need to really get a true understanding of the uh, range of species that are present in these waters. We need also to understand just the population densities of, of those different species. We need to know and identify nurseries, uh, pupping grounds. We need to know which of those hotspots are very close to the edge of being fully depleted or which areas are still relatively well populated. So we need to understand across the region what is the true status of sharks in these waters.